To begin today's event, we would like to recognize and acknowledge the traditional land and territory on which today's event is taking place. It's important to make note of the relational and contextual quality of this protocol. We would like to begin this by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga adjacent to the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and in the territory covered by the Williams Treaty. This place is and will continue to be home to Indigenous peoples. Let us move forward together with kindness and respect. Our speaker this afternoon is Karen Orth, who will be presenting on neck instability and Lyme disease, the potential connection. Karen lives with her family in Vancouver, BC, and has been the homemaker for the family since 1994. Her educational background is in science, which came along handy when their youngest child, Jess, became ill in 2016 at the age of 14. Along with her husband, Howard Eaton, and Jess, when she was able, they spent the next six years researching and brainstorming Jess's declining condition. This involved plenty of Googling, reading scientific medical journal articles, and many appointments involving a variety of healthcare professionals. We will have Karen present, and then we'll open for questions from the audience. You can ask questions by entering your questions into the chat box and or raising your hand using the icon. Please help us welcome Karen to the podium. I am very happy to be here and I am coming to you from Vancouver uh, in the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I will now share my screen, uh, which is right here. Share <clears throat> and I got to get it back to the beginning. Oops. Okay, that's the beginning there. And I got to move this, got to make this little thing smaller, I think. Move that up there. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about neck instability and Lyme disease. And um, basically, it's our daughter's story. Um, Jess was, uh, we adopted Jess from China when she was nine months old, and she was a healthy, happy baby, healthy, happy child, enjoyed school, enjoyed um, her friends, and loved sports, a very athletic person. Uh, her especially loved um, soccer, and in grade eight, she was really getting into ultimate frisbee, but grade eight is also when her health issues started, uh, which was 2016. So at the end of that uh, year, sort of towards the end of grade eight, she started having trouble breathing during a soccer game. And I took her to urgent care um, to, because we thought she was having an asthma attack or something, but she was pretty much better by the time we got there. And uh, so asthma was ruled out, but she was also experiencing brain fog and increased anxiety. And as the summer progressed, her stamina for sports was declining. Um, and obviously all this kind of makes the anxiety worse. Um, and I'm gonna mention this now, but we weren't actually thinking about it at the time. But a few months before these symptoms started, she'd gotten hit in the head by a soccer ball and um, it had looked kind of dramatic, but she continued to play. She wasn't knocked down and uh, the ref had kind of checked in with her and it seemed that she was okay. So the, the play continued, but later on, we do begin to wonder about this. And on the side, I'm just gonna keep a track of the symptoms that she experienced sort of adding to it as time goes on because they are always there for the next few years. So at the end, uh, over the summer, oh God, I'm thirsty already. Mm. Um, the beginning of grade nine, she got shingles, which is pretty uncommon for a 14 year old. <clears throat> and she really wasn't getting better from the shingles. So, she was super tired still a couple of weeks later. The, the shingles had been very mild. So we were like, okay, well, shingles, that's weird. Um, and my husband thought, you know, let's get her tested for Lyme and mono in case that's also something that could be going on. And she came back with a positive mono spot test and a negative Lyme test. Um, so seems that she has mono. So we're going to wait it out. She'll probably be better pretty soon. Um, but we will be coming back to these tests um, because they turn out there's more to it than that. And I'm going to skip over this, but suffice it to say some other stuff happens because this is kind of a, a long, I want to make it a bit shorter. So we continue kind of assuming that it was mono that she had. 
And so now she finishes grade nine. This is actually, she's really struggling a lot. Uh, the mental health part is hard because the sports had been the major thing for her. Um, she was so passionate about soccer and ultimate Frisbee, and yet she was getting, it was getting harder and harder for her to do. She still tried because she loved it. She loved getting together with her friends. Um, but the more she did, the more brain fog she got, she, the more exhausted she got. And by the beginning of grade 10, sort of, I think the second month of grade 10, she had to switch to online schooling because it was just not manageable for her anymore in the regular school. And at the end of grade 10, she's, well, every spring she would kind of rally again for ultimate. By, by grade 10, she wasn't playing soccer anymore. She was just playing ultimate as best she could. And she's still very skilled, but very tired. And it's, it's really frustrating for her. And it's the more she does, the more brain fog she gets. And she's starting to experience more, um, more transient symptoms, light, sound, smell, sensitivity, nausea, heart palpitations, trouble talking. So we check in with our new GP, the old one retired, we get a new one. And he has been awesome. I can't say enough good things about this guy. But he decides to uh, check because we're, of course, we're still kind of thinking it's mono, but he tests her for the two viruses that cause mono, cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus. And they both come back negative, which means that her monospot test a couple of years earlier was a false positive. And so he immediately refers her to a pediatrician because a false positive monospot test can mean certain things such as HIV, lupus, lymphoma, hepatitis. So the pediatrician orders tests for that. And she also orders a pulmonary test because of the trouble breathing. And uh, they all come back negative. So that's definitely good news for those things that are not great and um, a bit of a mystery about the breathing test. But I say, could she get an exercise stress test? Because the symptoms are always worse. The breathing is always a problem after she's been exercising or while she's exercising. And so this takes us to September of 2018, <clears throat> when she has the appointment with the exercise stress test with the cardiology department at BC Children's. And uh, they diagnose her with dysautonomia of adolescence. So dysautonomia um, basically means that your autonomic nervous system, the system that takes care of things that you don't usually have to worry about, uh, the involuntary processes of, you know, heart rate, heart, uh, blood pressure, respiration, digestion, all those things. Some signals are malfunctioning in this department. And I'm just going to draw your attention to the brainstem there because that might be important later. Um, so she uh, gets this diagnosis and actually we're, we're pretty thrilled by this because it certainly could explain what Jess has been experiencing. And the protocol seems pretty straightforward. You increase your fluid intake to three liters a day, you increase salt intake and you gradually increase your exercise. And they have a whole program for her to get going on and she's excited to head down that road. Um, and we're also heartened to know that many adolescents outgrow this by the time they're 19. Uh, in addition to seeing a pediatrician, we decided to start seeing, uh, having her see a naturopath as well. And he does some testing, including some allergy skin testing, uh, iron testing, not much comes of that, but also food sensitivity testing, hormone testing. These are um, special tests. And so we do change her diet. There seems to be things she should be avoiding. So she ends up with quite a limited diet and she starts herbal supplements. But he also uh, does the uh the hygienics test he orders that for her and she come it comes back positive um at least in one area now we also got this diagnosis about two weeks after the dysautonomia um diagnosis so we're already kind of committed to the dysautonomia protocol and i did talk to them about this but they don't it's the regular doctors never seem to comment on the hygienic stuff uh because it's not really their thing but this is what her her the, the this is the positive section of her test so it's um it's about in my opinion it's about the lowest positive you can get um the pluses there aren't a lot of pluses it's only three bands so we didn't understand this very much at the beginning um, at this time, but we decide not to pursue heavy duty antibiotic treatment about the Lyme. We kind of put that on the back burner in favor of the dysautonomia protocol. Um, 
and we carry on like that. Uh, but there are ups and downs over the next year. So this was the beginning of grade 11. All those diagnoses came at the beginning of grade 11. And but the trend is kind of downward. Uh, none of the protocol, none of the things are helping. The dysautonomia protocol isn't really helping. The supplements aren't helping. Dietary changes aren't helping. And her mental health is pretty low that winter. Um, in the spring, she rallied a bit for uh, playing to play ultimate, which again, she kind of felt it was sort of worth, she knew it would be painful, but it was, you know, one of the only things she could enjoy at this point. So she, and she would play less and less and she would coach from the sidelines or play her guitar on the sidelines, but it was something for her to get out and do. And there wasn't a day that went by that she did not experience day, brain fog and extreme fatigue. Um, and regularly the symptoms, there would be the transient symptoms would come and go as well, depending on what she was doing. And so this brings us to grade 12 and it's still trending downwards. Um, she continued with the online school and then the spring of that year, uh, COVID hit um, in her grade 12 year. And she had been planning on helping coach a high school team with a friend, but that was of course canceled. By the end of May, she's really quite distraught and sick and just very flat affect. And uh, we decide to take her to ER at Children's. Um, uh, kind of half wondering if it was like some weird COVID presentation, which in retrospect doesn't really make any sense, but she does get a COVID test, which is negative. And they can also offer her an outpatient psychiatric evaluation because she is just not, you know, not, it's tough. This is all very tough for her. Um, she opted instead for counseling. My husband um, recommended, found somebody who he thought would be suitable through his work. And, um, and yes, that turned out to be some really helpful counseling for her. Uh, she had done previous stuff related to all this, but it had been kind of CBT heavy and she really wasn't into that. So uh, this counselor she stayed with for the next year until the counselor went on maternity leave. And she worked very hard through the brain fog and all the other symptoms. And with accommodations and support, she did graduate from high school. Yay, Jess, way to go. Okay, so now that summer, she had applied to a postgraduate I mean, post-secondary schools, and she got into a few, but she realized she wasn't going to be able to manage, so she decided she'd rather take a gap year and kind of work on her health, see if she could get get to a point where things were more manageable. And she worked um, worked as a teaching assistant for our family has a, a school for children with learning disabilities, and because of COVID, it started online, so she um, enjoyed working, enjoyed that work, help, working as a teaching assistant. It was It was a manageable thing that she could do in a part-time kind of way. But that fall, she asked for a wheelchair. And I'm ashamed to say that I got scared. And because um, I felt that meant that she was giving up. And really all she wanted was to be able to get together with her friends. So this was a moment that we've revisited more recently where I realized it was like an ableist attitude on my part. Um, but it kind of, you know, she was really trying her best and just wanted to be able to do things still in her life. Um, she, at this point, she started, started feeling pain all over and way more frequent headaches. And so we started thinking back to the Lyme again, maybe we should be doing something about that. So we talked to the GP and he referred her to a rheumatologist. Um, and uh, the rheumatologist is, of course, not Lyme literate, so she doesn't think it's anything to do with Lyme, but she's concerned about the fatigue, and he re she recommended a referral to the Complex Chronic Disease Center in Vancouver. So that referral was put in, uh, I think, well, it's sort of the winter of 2020, which was more than two years ago now, and Jess is still waiting for an appointment, so uh, that'll be interesting when we get that appointment. Um, and she's learning a lot about myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. And to that end, she asked us to watch uh, Jen Bree's, uh, or she asked me to watch Jen Bree's documentary, Unrest, which is a very powerful um, look into Jen's life with the condition. And I Google her after the movie um, to see how she's doing, I mean, after the documentary. And her symptoms are all in remission 
after having neck stabilization surgery because her neck was unstable. She had craniocervical instability. She'd had the surgery done at the end of 2018. And uh, wow, I'm like blown away. This is like amazing news. I'm so excited for her. But I'm also pretty sure that this is not Jess's problem. It seems like such a such a specific thing that, you know, maybe as Jen says, there's a certain population that have this. So yeah, okay, that's that's nice. Um, now, my husband works with a lot of brain injury people as well. So he started thinking this just looks like a lot like post concussion syndrome to him. Um, so maybe the ball to the head did something in 2016. Uh, so we take her for a, to a physiotherapist to have a concussion um, uh, assessment. And yes, he also feels that these are concussion symptoms. Um, and he starts some physiotherapy, but uh, it's not really sustainable because it's all kind of exercise based. And that's what really aggravates Jess's symptoms as well. Um, uh, Howard, uh, my husband, also wondered if um, he found out about something called a perilymphatic fistula, which can cause dizziness, which Jess is now experiencing quite a bit of. Um, we talked to the GP about this, and he refers her to an ENT and uh, ear, nose, and throat specialist, and that appointment will be happening later. Um, in the meantime, we figure let's just get her a full body MRI to rule out anything else that might be going on inside her. And maybe they can look for the perilymphatic fistula. Oh, I should explain what that is. That's in the like in the bottom part of the skull near the ears. It's a little passageway that shouldn't be there. Um, uh, so they do the full body MRI and they do not see perilymphatic fistula, but they say, get a CT of the temporal bones if symptoms persist. So, okay, we're gonna work on having that done. Um, and she also does have the appointment with the uh, ear, nose and throat specialist who recommends vestibular physiotherapy. And that evaluation also, the, the person doing that felt it was a post-concussion kind of thing going on. And she does do some vestibular therapy, but it doesn't really doesn't really help. Um, at this point, this is a picture of Jess in her room because this is sort of what her life is like at this point. She's got noise canceling um, headphones on. She is spends most of her time in the dark, uh, and it's it's tough. She she had been working as an online teaching assistant still, but she can no longer manage. She really wants to be able to access um, disability benefits at the federal level and at the provincial level, um, and so. She figures a good way to do this would to get it to be to get a diagnosis of MECFS, and so she ends up ultimately being referred to a neuro neurologist for that. Um, and yeah, so just that is that is what her life is looking at. Like. Just not not great. Um, so back to getting the CT of the temporal bones to look into the perilymphatic fistula. They did not see one. They did do the CT at UBC. So that was done in the public system. Um, but what they saw was something called a large atlantodental interval suggesting instability. And the radiologist recommended getting flexion extension x-rays to assess the instability. So this is what that radiologist would have been looking at when they were looking for the perilymphatic fistula. So this, this is Jess's C1. Uh, as you can see, part of it's missing there. So this is what it should normally look like. This is the top vertebrae that attaches to your skull as well. These are the ligaments that are involved down here. The yellow one is the transverse ligament. Um, and uh, this is too big a gap. This is this is not good. And it's also not good that her C1 is in two pieces. And what's happening here, we don't, I don't really understand it until much later, but her uh it's in two pieces and it's sort of that they're attributing this to congenital non-fusion. It just didn't quite form properly as she was growing. And this part at this level is um, fused to her skull. So that is sort of uh, a bit of a bit of an issue. Um, these are the flexion extension x-rays. Uh, it's sort of hard to see in here, but trust me that when she puts her head forward, this is the gap that they were looking at. So that's a, a big gap. And when she puts her head back, that gap closes. So this is a, a, a more comfortable, well, better for her brainstem as we'll see in a little bit. Um, 
And this radiologist does diagnose her with ligamentous instability of C1, C2, which is also known as atlantoaxial instability. And her um, ADI is 5.5 millimeters, and it should be one to two millimeters in an adult. And they also notice that she has C2 and C3 are fused together. Um, so because the GP had ordered this report, I mean, had ordered this test, the CT, he was the one who gave the report and he felt that the instability was not a problem. We felt otherwise, and we because we remember Jen Bree of unrest, and uh, we get a referral to a spine surgeon. Now, the other thing that showed up in the full body MRI was that Jess had an enlarged pituitary gland. Um, so they recommended getting a, uh, a, a what? An MRI of that to look further into it. So this is the initial... Um, the full body MRI is on the right. This is her pituitary. Um, I'm personally not looking too closely at that at this point because I'm like alarmed at this. So this is when she goes to get the pituitary. Um, uh, her neck is in a different position, basically. It's the same machine, um, but maybe they did the pillows differently. And now the top of her uh, C2 here, the dens, it's also called the odontoid, is pressing into her brainstem. This just doesn't look good to me. Um, so we do a deep dive into Jen Bree's story. I read everything I can about her. She's had a very public recount of everything. And one of the people she consulted with is Jeff Wood. And Jeff Wood had had the same kind of issues the year, uh, you know, some years before. And he had his next stable, he kind of self-diagnosed, he diagnosed himself and with the help of a certain doctor, um, he was able to get, uh, who ad helped advocate him for, for him in the end. He had the surgery done at the beginning of 2018. Jen Bree, had Jen Bree had hers done at the end of 2018. And there's just a wealth of information on these websites of, you know, what what's going on or and uh, suffice it to say that their symptoms went into remission after neck stabilization surgery. Um, so a few things from Jeff Wood's uh, website. Uh, what he's proposing is that when your, your neck is unstable in the craniocervical instability kind of way, um, it's a kind of a position dependent brainstem compression. It's like having micro concussions. Uh, every time your head goes forward, the brainstem is kind of being dragged or you know bumping onto the onto the odontoid so it's like a little concussion that keeps happening um this kind of would help account for post exertion malaise in this population exercise is counterproductive because as you're moving you're you're bumping more and this would definitely explain why Jess's symptoms looked like a post concussion syndrome because it was uh you know concussiony but never quite post because it kept happening um and Jeff also talks about uh, the role of infections and instability. So our bodies secrete collagen degrading enzymes as part of our normal immune response, whether an infection is tick-borne, viral, doesn't seem to matter. So, and of course, ligaments are made of collagen so that if something's going kind of off and it could be degrading ligaments kind of thing. So, and uh, ME-CSF is often triggered by an infection. Uh, Jess's symptoms definitely got worse after the shingles. And perhaps that was like the last straw uh, between C1 and C2. And maybe the ball to the head had weakened in initially. And then also maybe this, the, you know, the even though she has like a low level of Lyme, maybe that's um, doing something as well. Uh, and then the arrow can also go the other way. Instability can cause, oops, infection. Um, so the thinking is, okay, you've got, so because of the instability, you've got the brainstem, um, you've got brainstem compression, which seems to be causing um, dysautonomia. So you're, you're, which, and part of the autonomic system that is malfunctioning is also includes the immune system. Um, so that is also kind of uh, brainstem compression is seems to be doing something to the immune system via the the autonomic dysfunction <laughs> via the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so Jess has her appointment with a spine surgeon at the end of May, and he did a physical assessment. I mentioned Jen Bree's story; he's not interested. 
and um, he feels Jess's symptoms are not from the instability. He didn't have access to the private pituitary MRI that we had done, so he couldn't see what I had seen, which was the brainstem kind of being uh, squished a bit by the odontoid, uh, but he does order more imaging for her. And in a little while, those actually get done quite quickly, and uh, we get uh, those reports pretty quickly. So I put the uh, FE MRI in quotes because it turned out they just did a normal um, MRI. They didn't do the flexion extension part of it. Uh, but the CT does note, uh, it confirms that she has a big AD atlanto -dental, atlanto dental interval. And it talks about her having mild basilar invagination, which is the same as brainstem compression, and mild kinking of the cervical medullary cord. So anytime the, the, that area is being kind of bent, it's, it's not, not great. Um, and they talk about, which I've already mentioned, that half of C1 is fused to her skull. That's called Atlanto-occipital assimilation. Um, this is what they were looking at. I didn't get this imaging until later, but I'm putting it in here because it can show you what's happening. So here's her odontoid again, again. Um, pressing into her brain stem. And it's this kind of angle in here that uh, is the mild kinking that is not, not the best for the brain stem. Um, I go through this whole thing where I think I'm seeing a, uh, a possible cerebrospinal fluid leak, but I'm not going to dwell on that because um, in for time reasons. Um, so now it seems that we have several possible explanations for symptoms. There's the atlantoaxial instability via brainstem compression. There's the uh, uh, MECFS, the chronic fatigue stuff, the dysautonomia, post-concussion syndrome, a CSF leak, and Lyme disease. And there's so many symptoms in common with all these things. Um, how on earth can you tell things apart? But in my opinion, the first two are just a collection of symptoms that we use when we don't actually know what's, what the ultimate cause is yet. Um, and I also think that brainstem compression can cause all of these things. Uh, a CSF leak, it could kind of be rubbing against the dura there and cause a leak. And also the Lyme disease, as Jeff Wood, given his theory that um, which makes a lot of sense that the immune system is wonky. So Lyme disease could kind of shine through. Um, she gets a second appointment to go over the imaging she's had done. And uh, the spine surgeon still feels that neck stabilization surgery would not help her um, help her symptoms. And I have a lot of questions and basically my answer, the answers are no, but he's also quite rushed during this appointment. So um, he doesn't get the full benefit of all my questions. Um, he reorders the flexion extension MRI uh, because it wasn't done properly. And that'll be done. I think that gets done in October. And now we're learning more about instability. We get all, I get all the imaging from the hospital on CD and I go through it and I learn about how to take measurements of instability from this video which I got from MEpedia, which is one of, you know, one of the things um, Jen Bree helped set up. Uh, an excellent resource. And I'm pretty sure there's not only a vertical component, but it's all pretty pathological. I, I mean, this really, it really seems that this is what people in the US would consider um, something that would be operated on. Um, so we figure it's time to get some second opinions. Uh, the first one we wanna get is um, from Dr. Balanese, who's the surgeon who did uh, Jen Bree and Jeff Woods um, uh, neck stabilization surgery. The surgery they had done was uh, plates and screws or uh, rods, I think, from skull, fusing their skull to their uh, vertebrae. Um, and also, I have so many radiology questions. I would love to uh, talk to a radiologist about all my questions that I have, because I think, you know, maybe there's, there's so much information in here. And if I maybe they're missing something, they are known to miss things. So I would just wanted to, you know, have my questions answered. Turns out that's not a thing. You don't just make an appointment with a radiologist. They don't really see patients or patients' mothers either. So that never happened. Um, and now this is late August and Jess is supposed to be looking after her friend's cat. So I would drive her and she would feed the cat and lie down with the cat for a while. And, and then I'd bring her home after about an hour or so. 
So I go up to her room and I say, okay, Jess, I can drive you to Naomi's house now. And she is lying on her bed, watching her, uh, she has her laptop on her stomach and she's been watching a show, but her head is in a fully flexed position. Um, and she basically looks non-responsive, but her eyes are open and I'm quite alarmed. And I'm thinking I, I might have to call the, the hospital, call the, uh, call an ambulance here. I don't want to move her because I know this could be a neck thing. Um, but I do say to her, I said, if you're able to, can you roll over onto your side? And um, after a moment or so, she she does this and her neck gets into a better position. And about 20 seconds later, she pops up and she says, oh, I feel so much better. Um, and that's when sort of the point where she became aware that her neck position and her symptoms were related. And she she starts trying to sleep in a better position. But it's hard because, you know, when you move, you uh, I mean, she moves a lot in her sleep. So uh, it wasn't always sometimes she would wake up feeling a little bit better, having slept probably in a better position. I'm just going to skip over this quickly, but we did get an upright flexion extension thing MRI done in cam loops and that sort of makes us think more about that ligament there um and the good thing out of those MRIs was that her pituitary gland now looks fine um and I'll quickly mention that it was that pituitary thing was investigated by an endocrinologist as well and there was no uh it wasn't affectioning it wasn't affecting her hormone her hormones at all so but uh and then um so my husband of course knew that I wanted to speak to a radiologist and he and his business partner um have somebody who they think might be able to help me so they arranged for me to speak to a U.S. doctor who has extensive experience with neurorehabilitation and brain injury I am so excited um to uh to be able to talk to somebody he's not a radiologist but he seems to you know he probably knows some stuff um however it takes a turn uh, he um, uh, he asks for you know all the imaging reports and other tests that we have done. So I send him all those things before our Zoom. But I left out the stuff that the naturopath had ordered because I figure he's like a regular doctor. He's probably not interested in those things. But he specifically asks if she's had any other Lyme test done. So I send him the 2018 one, and he says. In looking at her results of her Western blot from 2018, this is one for which I would have begun ceftraxone IV for chronic Lyme. Can we get another Western blot to see your current status? If this is at least part of the answer, it could well be a game changer. So I'm I'm partly horrified that we had dropped this in the past and super excited that, you know, okay, now we have confirmation that we should be doing something about this. He didn't think that it was brainstem compression because the symptoms he felt would be more global as in we're Worse. Um, and he also mentioned that all this research I've been doing was valuable, but don't forget about Jess as a person, spend lots of time with her. And we always had spent as much time as Jess could, could gather. We watched a lot of shows together, but this guy was actually super nice. And I was not at all offended by this reminder. And, um, and we continued spending, you know, time together, which was mostly watching shows on TV. I watched a lot of anime and all sorts of things, all sorts of things. Very, very entertaining. Um, so we start treating the Lyme, which has to be done not by a regular doctor, but by a naturopath and not by IV, but oral antibiotics, because this is Canada. Um, and uh, this is what she starts on. Uh, it's going to be a three month uh course of antibiotics and she starts it's going to be doxycycline and azithromycin and so she starts heads down that road and she also the naturopath also orders a retest of the Lyme and includes uh, co-infections and they come back the co-infections there are no co-infections so that's great news and this is also a very weakly positive so whatever level of Lyme she has it's actually pretty low um, but it is not, not zero. Um, so now I'm going to uh, imagine in the background, Jess is getting, having, getting treated, uh, doing the antibiotics. I'm going to have a little interlude about genetics here. So as I mentioned, she was adopted from China when she was nine months old. And earlier in the year, so this is now kind of October, but I think in the spring, like May or so, we had watched One Child Nation together. It's a documentary about what it was like for families in China during the one child policy. And suffice it to say, it was horrible, very hard in that department. Um, 
And we realized that Jess would very much like to search for her birth family. And amazingly, within a few months, Longland Stye and Brian Stye of Research China were able to locate her family with the help of friends in China. And in October, they are reunited um, over WeChat, which has a translation ability, which is great. And they are, everybody's just so happy to know that everybody's safe. Um, and it's a lot to process for everyone, but um, it's uh, pretty amazing. Part of, you know, we were wondering, would her family have any um, family history of something that might explain what was happening? But it wasn't really the right time to ask about all that. And, uh, but we can see that everybody looks healthy and um, we do, because we have a video chat shortly after this. Um, and, uh, and when we ask many months later, they are actually very healthy. And this is her family, dad, mom, um, oldest sister, next sister, Jess is the third sister. And this is her younger brother. Her, Jess photoshopped herself and her brother in. Her brother was away at school at this time. And anyway, this is the, um, the families of the sister and her grandma. Um, okay, now I'm just gonna quickly update you with her neurology appointment because she was trying to get the MECSF diagnosis. Uh, so I'm just gonna say, no, she did not get the diagnosis and he didn't want to do that. He didn't think she had Lyme. And so we sort of give up on him and Jess asks the GP to fill out the forms for the, for the government benefits, which he does and they are successful and she is relieved. And that was really helpful. Um, and now just another quick interlude to check back because it occurred to me at this point to get the actual report from her 2016 uh, BC CDC Lyme test, which shows that there was actually some part of it that was reactive. The final interpretation was non-reactive, but if this patient has traveled to a Lyme disease endemic area in Europe, please telephone the lab and get, you know, see what further testing should be done. And I was like, what? Oh my goodness. What if she wasn't in Europe, but she'd been in China? Was there, could there have been like some, was she in a Lyme area of China? Um, and plus, could she have gotten this from her mother, um, congenital Lyme? So these are kind of questions that are out there now. I didn't pursue anything at this point. Um, but we did ask the GP to redo this test and it does come back completely negative now. Um, so this is now, we're into the second month of treating the Lyme, October, November of 21. We increased the doxycycline a bit. And uh, now we're gonna have a little interlude about Lyme. So this is a great book um, by Dr. Bill Rawls. And uh, we also listened to an interview of his and things we learned were that Borrelia feed on collagen rich tissue and ligaments are collagen rich. So they themselves could be degrading ligaments. Um, then the difference between an acute and chronic stages of infection. If the test is taken long enough after the initial bite, the result might be negative, but that doesn't mean you don't have some level of Lyme. Um, humans are full of microbes and a healthy immune system can keep the microbes at a low level so the symptoms don't appear. Uh, but if the immune system is disrupted, the microbe pot can boil over, causing symptoms. Jess had had like a really great immune system before the age of 14. If everyone in the family, she'd be the last one to get sick, if at all, and her symptoms would always be way milder. Um, and yet she got shingles when she was 14 and symptoms of chronic Lyme, which of course overlap with many other conditions. Uh, but it certainly seems possible that the brainstem compression she was experiencing could, could be disrupting her immune system. Now, here's a, another little interlude to talk about some other things we learned along the way. There's um, a guy who does prolotherapy, Dr. Ross Hauser in Florida. He has a very interesting website, lots of information on there as well. Um, and uh, he had often seen he had worked at some point in a Lyme endemic area and uh, a lot of people with Lyme symptoms and those symptoms would be alle alleviated or eliminated after neck stabilization uh, or neck instability is treated by prolotherapy. So prolotherapy is where you get injections into the, into the ligaments and um, it can improve their, their function. Uh, and that this was also a really interesting study. It's a TBI clinic that they, a certain pot part, some of the people were not getting better from their uh, protocol. And they found that often people had uh, also Lyme 
diagnosis. And if they treated the Lyme, the patients would then get better. So it's kind of uh, the other side of this. And a friend of my mom's had been diagnosed with um, a Lyme literate doctor in BC. And uh, she mentioned that there were a number of people in the Lyme community in BC who have craniocervical instability. So the, there seems to be a lot of big comorbid morbidity with all this stuff. So now we're entering the third month of her treatment with Lyme and uh, continuing with the, the last month of the antibiotics and we throwing in the herbs for good measure. Um, uh, what is this? So after the antibiotics are done, she continues with the herbs and she gets retested by the Armin lab thing, uh, Armin lab tests, and there is no change in her level of Lyme. It's exactly the same as before. And we also do a quick mold detox thing, which, you know, she starts a protocol for that too. But now I want to go back to September of this year because we did not drop, even though we started doing the Lyme uh, treatment, we did not drop the AAI investigation. So we're still thinking about all this. Um, uh, we have a consultation with uh, Jeff Wood and ask him lots of questions about conservative treatment, cost of surgery with Dr. Bolognese being Canadian. And he know he knows of no, oh geez, okay, well anyway, he knows of no doctor in Canada that does surgery for AAI for this particular set of symptoms. I think it has to be a lot worse um, is sort of my understanding. And he's had seen a lot of patients in the CCI community who had Lyme and he recounted how his own virus titers were normal after neck stabilization. So again, pointing to the, um, the immune system kind of malfunctioning because of the instability, which is the brainstem issue. We start the process of getting a second opinion from Dr. Bolognese. It's a very long form, but we get it going. And this is more about the CSF leak, which I'm kind of shoving in the background here. Um, October, lots of appointments are made. She gets the flexion extension MRI um, and the appointment with a spine surgeon is booked for November. And now we're going to book an appointment with Dr. Chris Centeno of the Centeno Schultz Clinic in Colorado, who offers a non-surgical treatment of a transverse ligament of a, or is, could she be a candidate for his treatment, which is a, a kind of a new regenerative prolotherapy thing. And that appointment is scheduled for no, the end of November. And we submit all the forms to Dr. Bolognese for the uh, second opinion. November, the appointments happen. The spine surgeon, this is the third and final appointment she has. His opinion is unchanged. She would probably not benefit from fusion surgery and he recommended more exercise, which made me pretty angry, actually. I tried not to let it show, but I was pretty furious because that was, she would have loved to be doing more exercise. Um, uh, so we have an appointment with Dr. Uh, Chris Centeno and he's looking at, this is again, just to see if she could be a candidate for this uh, non-surgical treatment. And he looks at her imaging and he says, wow, that's an epic ADI. And uh, it's more likely that she'll need surgery. Um, so, and his experience, he has a lot of Canadian patients um, as well. And AAI is not well recognized or treated in Canada. And I'm paraphrasing there, his, uh, his words were a little, a little more slightly harsher. Um, he recommended her trying a hard cervical collar for a couple of days and see if that helped with the symptoms. And we also said, is there any other imaging you could benefit from to fully assess if she could be a candidate for your, uh, for your prolotherapy? And he said, well, you could get a digital motion x-ray. So we say, okay, we'll get, we'll see if we can do that. She does start wearing the hard cervical collar and definitely notices a difference in the brain fog and generally a lessening of her symptoms. So that's kind of awesome. Uh, and we, uh, I start the process of getting the DMX done at the Whiplash Clinic in Langley, which is just outside of Vancouver with um, Dr. Sasha Blaskovich. Um, I email everything to him, all uh, the imaging or get it all to him. And his he emails me uh, before the appointment and says, this young lady has been through a tornado of doctors and evaluations. I have looked over the imaging provided. Thank you for providing such a detailed dossier. Can you tell me what injuries Jess has sustained prior to the brain fog onset of 2016? So I am thrilled that this is going to be like a back and forth kind of thing. Um, a conversation begins and we do tell him about um, 
the 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 ball to the head when she was younger or but you know the few months before the onset of symptoms uh and now this is now okay just as a the appointment is gonna for with the dmx is gonna happen on december 21st but the day before that we get dr balinese's report it was actually available a few weeks before this but i had thrown the email in the trash for some reason i don't know how i did that because i'd been looking out for it so it's a very embarrassing moment for me um but we do get the point we do get his report and he has accepted her as a new patient um and uh the next step would be invasive traction test and surgery in new york if that went all went well um so we know that now that that is an option for jess uh we uh the next day we have jess has her appointment with the sat with dr blaskovich um and gets the dmx done uh Okay, so here is the DMX. Here's what you see. So I'm just gonna pause it. We're looking in this area here. Okay, so this is her head is forward. So I'm just gonna pause it here. Her brainstem is in the back here. And at this point, it's kind of draped over, this is her odontoid and it's this is the point at which it's pressing. Um, and then you can see it shift back her whole head. I don't know if people can see that very well, but and then it goes forward again and again. So it's in the forward position where the brainstem gets draped over the odontoid. Ugh. Anywho, okay, you get the idea. Um, and other things we learn at that appointment. Actually, I have to say the DMX is pretty much, it's a lot like the flexion extension x-rays she had earlier, um, but it shows you know, it's like a movie, obviously, you can see that. Um, so other things we learned from Dr. Blaskovich, AAI is not well understood or treated in Canada. So we've been hearing a lot of that. <clears throat> he himself has it um, from a football injury, but he can manage it with uh, special techniques he's developed and he helps other patients with these techniques. So uh, he has a lot of whiplash and head injury patients, and this is often seen in that. Um, and he wonders, had we considered other surgeons beside Dr. Bolognese? No, but we're open to suggestions. And he recommends um, Dr. Atul Goyal in Mumbai, who is probably the leading expert in this type of surgery. And he offers to forward all Jess's information to him to see what he thinks. And we say, yes, please do that. And we go home and we Google Dr. Atul Goyal. We do our due diligence and we basically find that he is extremely well respected and experienced, probably, you know, way, way ahead of anybody else in the field. The technique that Dr. Bolognese uses, um, he, he and his colleagues developed some years earlier, and he no longer actually does that one. He does a this kind of different one. And we hear back in January from Dr. Goyle through Dr. Blaskovich. And Dr. Goyle has responded and states that Jess is a perfect candidate for fusion and expects her to regain her new life. And we are like just blown away by this news. Um, we do some more due diligence, contact, talk to a Canadian patient who went to him the year before. We Zoom with everybody, we ask each other questions. And Jess would like to proceed with the surgery. Uh, so uh, here we go. The schedule is, surgery, is scheduled for February 26th. She stops all the mold and Lyme uh, treatment about two weeks before that. And we go to India. Here she is. Uh, we definitely got a wheelchair for all the airport travel. And she meets with his team. Um, and then she gets the surgery. And this is what the surgery looks like. Two plates and four screws that now are, her neck is very stable. Um, after that, in the recovery process, they had her walking 24 hours after the surgery. Uh, it wasn't pleasant for her, but she did it. And uh, it's a different kind of pain she's experiencing now. It's more like a surgical pain and her symptoms are in remission. Here's a picture with Dr. Goyle and Dr. Abinov, his other person who works with him and some in, in pictures of India. And we returned to Vancouver uh, in the middle of March. And as her body adjusted, transient symptoms would kind of appear, which would kind of freak us out momentarily. But a couple of times she thought that the Lyme was back and she would take a full 20 drop dose of cryptolepis, which is one of the herbs she was taking. Previously, it had 
um, made her feel very sick. She couldn't get past 10 drops. 10 was her absolute max. And she would usually keep it before be below that. So because she was, this was like the 20 drops was doing nothing. She felt, you know, didn't feel any worse after that. We figured that the, it was, the Lyme is not an issue anymore. Now that the brain fog was much better, she had the capacity to process more of what she had gone through in the past six years. And, and that was a lot. Um, all along the way, she shared her story on Instagram at that uh, thing. And there's a picture of her shortly after we got back from um, from India. So trying to put it all together, these are some things that can put a person at risk for having atlantoaxial instability. Jess had a few of them. Um, and I just wanted to add in the, uh, the immune response, like if that's a little, if, if you're getting too much immune response, that can also degrade the ligaments. So I threw that in there. And of course, if you get atlantoaxial instability, you're more likely to have brainstem compression. Of course, not everybody gets this, but this can happen. And brainstem con compression can lead to autonomic dysfunction, um, uh, including the immune system. And so say your immune system is kind of wonky, you're going to get maybe too much response, which is now going to degrade the ligaments some more, or maybe too little, and now you're going to get the symptoms from uh, your, your infection, which of course probably overlap with some of the autonomic dysfunction. Everything gets very confusing. Um, anyway, that's sort of, I'm trying to sum things up there. And I did talk, so a few months ago, I did call the microbiologist, because I did still curious about that Lyme test. So could Jess have acquired Lyme as an infant in China? And, you know, he kind of imagined Jess as a baby. Well, she wouldn't have been crawling around. So it's unlikely that she would have been um, bitten by a tick. Uh, plus it was also winter. Uh, so, you know, I, that, that's plausible. And then what about, could she have got it congenitally from her mother? And uh, he said that there's no evidence of congenital Lyme in peer reviewed journals. So that was not something he believes in. And finally, I just want to mention uh, Athena Hall's website. I thought this was a really great website. She's one of the patient partners and she's in this room today and that she is the person who did the intro. Um, and her it's focus on healing with very up-to-date information, including a, a transcript of a talk uh, by Dr. Stephen Harris given recently, who mentions David Kaufman's work. And he was Jeff Wood's doctor that helped him, helped advocate for him. So that's all kind of come back. And there's also, she has a link to Jen Curtin, who I'd never heard of, um, but I feel like I should be reaching out to her and telling her Jess's story because she's got, she's deals with a lot of MECFF -E patients as well, including long COVID and is well-versed with CCI. So um, I highly recommend this. It has, this website also has lots of other sources. Um, lots of other things to share. And that is basically the end of my story. So I guess I'm going to stop sharing. And here I am. Oh, Jess is in the room. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your story. Uh, we appreciate all the information that you gathered and uh, the bravery for both you, Jess, and the family. So thank you so much for uh, taking us through uh, the many years of hardship. I'm just going to check the chat box and Q&A and see if there are any questions or hands up. Oh, I see a couple of hands up, and I'll start with Veronica. Veronica, are you able to unmute? Oh, I was just plotting the presentation. I don't actually have a question at this point, but there was a question. Um, that said, where was the upright MRI performed? Yeah, I see that. Okay, um, that was in Kamloops. So there is a, a place called the Welcome Back Clinic and they have an upright MRI. So that's where we had that done. And it didn't really, I mean, it did give us more information, um, uh, uh, but it, it was sort of redundant information. And and uh, I know some people uh, think that that is important and we did learn stuff from it. So yeah, that's Kamloops, the Welcome Back Clinic. It's in BC. Thank you. And are there any other questions? Just checking the chat box and I don't see any hands up. Um, I would say thank you, Karen, for pulling together all of that information. That's years of research 
Um, I know we're just meeting now at this moment, uh, but I actually myself have spent years and we've been overlapping the research uh, I found out today. So uh, <laughs> I greatly appreciate all that you've shared. I'll be going back collectively to look at some of this information myself. And Great. um yeah, I just want to say that I will also post um, uh, a Q&A from Dr. Kaufman when I raised a question at the MECFS um, conference in 2021, which addressed this issue, addressed mm -hmm. CCI, AAI, and the connection with many uh, patient populations uh, using some of these umbrella terms in diagnosis or diagnostic categories, but how CCI seems to be a consistent theme among many different patient populations, whether congenital at risk or Lyme at risk, or um, MCAS, the inflammation piece you mentioned at risk. Um, so um, that's part of uh, where I'm trying to link all these and bring them together in, in a mutual vision. Yeah, that's really valuable. Thanks, Tina. I'm just gonna open up my screen and, and go ahead in case any other questions pop up about tomorrow's presentation. But happy to take any more, yeah, as you said, questions from the audience. I don't see any more questions or hand raise, raising. Do you, Athena, at all? Don't see any. Well, I personally would like to thank Karen uh, and Jess for allowing this opportunity to have your story told uh, to our to our members of our network. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Athena for helping to moderate uh, today's uh, presentation. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that we are continuing our series of talks tomorrow. Uh, we have Dr. Martin Vordu, who will be presenting on Spirochi. Uh, sorry, a uh, spirochete load in the host and tick is critical for transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi sensolato. So that presentation is tomorrow at noon Eastern time. Hopefully you can join us. Also wanted to remind everybody that we uh, there's still a chance to take part in our challenge. Wear green, take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness of Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. You can even send in photos of your creative artwork if you like to draw or sketch or pottery or things like that. If you take a photo of your work that expresses Lyme disease or tick-borne diseases, those photos will also be entered in the draw and all photos received before May 31st will be entered in the draw of one of four $25 Starbuck e-gift cards, and you can send your photos to clydern at gmail.com along with your name and email. And finally, uh, we will be having our scientific symposium, TickNet Canada, um, in October, October 24th and 25th in person in Toronto. We're just working out the logistics and should have registration abstract submission opening up soon. We're hoping to share that information before the month is done. Um, so thank you again for attending. Hope to catch you uh, this week and we will be continuing our series of talks throughout the month. Again, thank you to Athena and thank you to Karen and Jess uh, for uh, sharing your story and your journey with us. Uh, take care, everybody, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks.